Okay, folks, welcome to chapter nine, Let Human Development, Lifespan View. Uh, Kavanaugh and Vale, uh, ninth edition. All right. Okay, so in this chapter, we're going to be talking about identity development, self esteem. We're going to be talking about romantic relationships, sexual behavior. We're going to be talking about uh, how teenagers pick careers and how they're influenced by part time work. And we're going to be talking about the causes and consequences of substance use, depression, and delinquency in adolescence. All right. Some key questions for identity. How do adolescents achieve an identity? What are the stages in resulting requiring an ethic identity? And how does self-esteem change in adolescence? So this first stage, or this stage uh, is the stage that Erickson called achievement and versus role confusion or identity confusion. So he saw that the main task of adolescence was to achieve a stable identity. Um, there's certainly a lot more than that going on in adolescence, but that is a big part of it. Okay. Um, so this is a old theory, classic theory on identity formation, and it outlines four possible kind of outcomes. Uh, diffusion, foreclosure, moratorium, and achievement. So identity diffusion, individual is overwhelmed by the task of achieving identity and does little to accomplish the task. Foreclosure, the individual has a status determined by adults rather than personal exploration. Um, so the example here is helpful, I think. For as long as she can remember, Sucker's parents have told her that she should be an attorney and join the family law firm. She plans to study pre-law in college, though she's never given the matter much thought. So, you know, if she forecloses on her identity, she's going to pay the price by either being miserable for many years or having a midlife crisis and changing careers, right? So when you don't progress through a stage in a healthy way, in a proper way, you do end up paying some sort of price for that. Identity moratorium, individuals examining different alternatives, but as yet to find one that is satisfactory. So example here. Brad enjoys most of his high school classes. Some days he thinks it would be fun to be a chemist. Some days he wants to be a novelist. Some days he'd like to be an elementary school teacher. He thinks it's a little weird to change his mind so often, but he enjoys thinking about different jobs. And the ideal one, individual has explored alternatives and has deliberately chosen a specific identity. I would leave out the word deliberate. Um, sometimes it just sort of happens, oftentimes, you know, just over time. But um, you know, gradually we sort of figure out who we are. We don't really know when we're 16, but by the time we're 25, we kind of do. And that process can, you know, we can go through that cycle. Maybe you're you're in a relationship, you have start a relationship in college and you stay with someone for a few years and you're a certain person in that relationship, then you break up and now you're kind of trying to find yourself again, trying to figure out who you are and who you want to be in this next phase of your life. Or maybe you come out as gay or trans, or maybe uh, you make a big change to your religious identity or things like that, right? So it can often happen um, that people go through multiple sort of rounds of identity formation, especially in the modern world. Characteristics of adolescence thinking, egocentrism, sort of self-absorption, um, Imaginary audience, the feeling that their behavior is being watched. Personal fable is a belief that many adolescents have that their feelings and experiences are unique and have never been had by anyone else. An illusion of invulnerability is the adolescent's belief that bad things cannot happen to them. Some of the things that we attribute to adolescents are just in some ways a product of not having experienced a lot of life. You know, life can beat you down over time. And so adolescents and young people tend to be more optimistic and feel more invulnerable. They maybe haven't experienced the setbacks that older people have in their life. Ethnic identity is a feeling of belonging and learning the special customs and traditions of their group's culture and heritage developed by members of ethnic minority groups. There are three phases to achieving this identity. It starts with disinterest and exploration of the ethnic identity, followed by distinct achievement of an ethnic self-concept. Generally, ethnic minorities benefit from a strong ethnic identity. They find their interactions with family and friends more satisfying. They're happier and worry less. But also on the other side is that when immigrants, immigrant adolescents cling to their old ways, problems can develop. So it's important for ethnic minorities to have an identity that incorporates elements of their ethnic identity. But 
if it's too much in that direction, that can also cause problems for people. And if you're going back and forth, that can be a sign that you're not sort of comfortable or confident or feeling good about either identity. Um, Okay, self-esteem in adolescence, children's self-esteem gradually increases during the elementary school years, but dips when they begin middle school. Middle school is sort of, you know, in a lot of ways, the beginning of adolescence or close to the beginning. And that's, you're really starting at a low point in a lot of ways. You've got, you know, dating and people are starting to use drugs or you're hearing about it or parties and new social stuff. And you're sort of the least self-confident, the least good at managing your emotions you'll ever be, the least knowledgeable about this new kind of world you have to navigate. So it's it's really a, quite an uphill climb those middle school years through high school to kind of try and figure things out. Uh, adolescents differentiate your self, their social self-esteem. So they might feel positive about their relationship with a parent or their parents, but maybe negative about other kinds of relationships. Uh, self-worth is ethnicity and age dependent. Um, so there's variations based on those factors. It tends to get better as people get older in adolescence. Adolescent self-esteem is based on their self-perception, social comparisons they make, and reflected appraisals. Um, so for example, self-esteem is higher when they are skilled in the domains they value. Their parents view them positively, they're affectionate and involved. Their parents set reasonable expectations and are willing to discuss rules and discipline, and they believe peers think highly of them. Okay. Um, this slide is called the myth of storm and stress. So uh, is, is adolescence a time of storm and stress? Well, there is a body of research showing that, you know, there is a certain level of stability. Most adolescents love their parents. They feel loved. They feel appreciated. They feel wanted by them. Doesn't mean that it's not also a time of stressors, but uh, maybe sometimes we just focus on the storm and stress aspect of it. Maybe that makes a better story. Uh, most adolescents look to their parents for advice and embrace many of their val values. Parent-child conflicts do happen, but often they're mild. And when they're serious, they are very distressing for parents. These conflicts are more common when adolescents cannot regulate their emotions well. So like everything, there's a lot of variation in some households. Adolescents can be a time of really intense conflict. The average household, probably not so much. Romantic and sexual stuff. Uh, why do teenagers date? <laughs> why are some adolescents sexually active? What circumstances make dating violence especially likely? Who are sexual and gender minority youths? Okay. So by the end of high school, only two thirds of people have dated, right? So it's not like everyone is dating and having sex in high school. That's by the end. So one third, 33 out of 100 have not really dated by the end of high school. Uh, cultural factors can influence timing of relationships. Romantic relationships often build on friendships. These relationships are often developmentally significant. Adolescents involved in a romantic relationship are more confident and have greater self-esteem. Adolescents involved in a romantic relationship also report more emotional upheaval and conflict. Early dating with multiple partners can be problematic and is related to unsatisfying adult relationships later on. So this is one of those correlation causation things. It's not that dating causes problems later, but people that start dating at a young age typically come from high stress uh, backgrounds. Maybe there's uh, various kinds of traumas involved. And um, that's what's sort of leading to the unsatisfying uh, adult relationships later on, not the dating in, a, in adolescence itself. By the end of high school, two thirds of adolescents will have had sex at least once or intercourse, as it says here. Uh, being sexually active is predicted by parents or peers, sexually permissive attitudes, extroversion and impulsivity and characteristics of settings such as when they've been drinking. So. Whether a person has sex or not in high school, essentially, is influenced by things like their parents' attitudes towards sex, their own personality traits like introversion and impulsivity, um, you know, how soon you start puberty. We talked about that in the previous chapter. Uh, peer approval and adolescents believing peers are having sex is also a factor. Programs that teach teens about the risks and benefits of sex result in teens who have safer sex, use contraceptives, and have fewer partners. 
dating violence, which can include physical violence, emotional violence, sexual violence, or stalking, is reported by 25% of girls and 15% of boys. That is quite a lot, and it's probably larger than that. It's just what's reported. Risk factors for perpetrating violence include exposure to violence at home, peers who condone the behavior, being antisocial, aggressive, and not successful in school, and using drugs. Uh, for victims of uh, sexual violence, sexual assault, physical assault, consequences are things like depression, substance abuse, obviously anxiety, antisocial behavior. Okay, let's talk about sexual minority youth. Attraction to same-sex individual often first emerges around age 10 for males and females. It is typically preceded by years of gender nonconformity. Um, it might mean a girl who's more of a tomboy and likes to play sports, but it might not be. Um, sexual and gender minority youths face many challenges, including harassment, which can lead to depression and drug use. These youth cope more effectively when they receive support from parents and peers and when their schools feel safe and welcoming. Okay, the world of work. How do adolescents select an occupation? It's kind of crazy that people are expected to figure out what they want to do for the rest of their life when they're so young. Um, what is the impact of part-time employment on adolescents? Okay, Super's th three-phase theory of career development. First phase, crystallization is using ideas about talents and interests to shape one's provisional career prospects. Usually takes place around 13 or 14. I mean, look, some 14-year-olds whose parents don't really know very much about the world, don't maybe don't have a lot of education themselves or have substance abuse issues or whatever it might be. You know, they're, those kids are maybe not necessarily gonna be able to think about these things at 13 to 14. So that's just typical um, and there's individual variation. But second phase is specification to further limit one's prospects by learning more about career matches to one's interests, abilities and personalities usually takes place around 18 when people are thinking about what major in college. And third phase, implementation is entering the workforce, learning firsthand about jobs, responsibility, productivity, cooperation, needed lifestyle changes. It takes place between late adolescence and early 20s. According to Holland's personality type theory, work is fulfilling when it fits important facets of personalities. So according to this particular theory, uh, we have personality types of realistic, investigative, social, conventional, enterprising, and artistic. And some uh, careers that could go along with those, mechanic, truck driver, construction worker, for realistic, although um, he's describing this as enjoying doing physical labor, working with their hands, solving concrete problems. Investigative could be a scientist or a technical writer. Individuals are task-oriented, enjoy thinking about abstract relations, social, Individuals are skilled verbally and impersonally, teacher, counselor, social worker. Conventional, individuals have verbal and quantitative skills they like to apply to structured, well-defined tasks assigned to them by others. Bank teller, payroll clerk, traffic manager. Enterprising, individuals enjoy using their verbal skills and positions of power, status, and leadership. Business executive, TV producer, real estate agent. And artistic, individuals enjoy expressing themselves through unstructured tasks. Poet, musician, actor. Okay. Social cognitive theory. Another approach to social cognitive theory says that progress towards a vocation relies or rests on self efficacy or use beliefs about their abilities to succeed in specific domains and outcome expectations or what they believe will be the outcome of their behavior. Successes and failures promote adolescents to develop beliefs about themselves leading to interests and then goals, right? So adding kind of another layer to all this, say a person's artistic and creative, and maybe they love acting, but they don't feel good enough like about themselves, like that they can make that work as a career path. So there's various factors that are going to sort of overlay on top of uh, parental influences and uh, broader social influences. Um, and then personality types, there's kind of all different factors that are going to sort of eventually lead someone to choosing a particular path. About 20% of American high school students have part-time jobs, typically in retail. More than 15 to 20 hours a week leads to lower grades, anxiety, depression, lower self-esteem, 
can also lead to unrealistic ideas about money since most teens spend most of their money earnings on themselves from five to 10 hours a week leads adolescents to build skills self-esteem is enhanced economic skills improve if teens save money for a larger goal summer employment does not conflict with the demands of school so generally leads to benefits a uh, short story, moral of the story, there are benefits for adolescents working, although it is less common than it used to be. Okay, the dark side. Welcome to the dark side. Why do teenagers drink and use drugs? Well, because it stimulates the reward centers of their brains, and they like that. We all like that, but adolescents in particular like that. What leads some adolescents to become depressed? How can depression be treated? What are the causes of juvenile delinquency? Not sure why they didn't include like anxiety on this slide because that's a pretty big thing these days but you know. okay i did the wrong button most in reality most adolescents avoid drugs with one major exception alcohol 50 percent of teenagers drank in the last year 33 percent have been drunk so only a third of teenagers have been drunk in the last year drinking is more likely when parents and peers drink and when teens are coping with stress Stopping teens from drinking before it becomes habitual is essential to prevent future depression, anxiety, and alcohol dependence. Smoking usually begins between sixth and ninth grade. Approximately 25% of teens experiment with cigarettes, nearly 50% experiment with vaping. So about the same as alcohol. Smoking is more likely when, when friends and parents smoke and less likely when parents have an authoritative parenting style. Uh, again, this probably has to do with socioeconomic status more than anything else. Comprehensive school and community programs can reduce teen drinking and smoking. Depression during adolescence involves pervasive feelings of sadness, emptiness, irritability, anger, poor sleep, low self-esteem, and inability to concentrate. So it's not always necessarily sad. It could just be feeling empty and listless and laying in bed all day and feeling nothing. Depression can result from heredity, negative events, traumas, feelings of lack of control. By age 17, 20% of girls and 15% of boys have symptoms of depression. Um, so overall, that would mean 35% of uh, people, over a third. Psychotherapy is successful in helping adolescents who are depressed. Um, doesn't mean that it cures everyone's depression. Some people benefit more from it than others. Uh, antidepressant drugs are also effective, but likely more effective when done in conjunction with therapy. Medication just by itself can be life-saving in the short term, but long-term it does not cure depression or anxiety, but therapy can, although it doesn't always work. And there are other treatments as well, but that is a different topic. Uh, two approaches, antidepressant drugs, uh, attempt to correct imbalances in neurotransmitters. Sometimes they have side effects, sometimes they increase suicide risk, sometimes they have other negative side effects. Sometimes they work really well at first, but then don't stop, stop, don't keep working as well. Sometimes they don't work at all. Um, Long-term therapy tends to be better uh, than drugs, although oftentimes together they're even better. Uh, left untreated depression can disrupt school performance and relationships, increase risk of adult depression. Prevention programs reduce high risk youth number of depressive episodes. Preventing teen suicide. I think it's worth noting if we're talking about this topic, um, you know, there's a lot of factors that increase anxiety and depression. Um, things, some things that can reduce anxiety and depression, a big, big one is exercise. Um, breathing exercises, running, any sort of cardio, any sort of strength training, spending time in nature, eating healthier, uh, certain vitamins. So a lot of things connected to a healthy lifestyle, um, you know, volunteering, helping other people. Um, so there's a lot of different approaches and th activities that can help a person become uh, more mentally healthy. Newer uh, drugs, you have your traditional antidepressants and anti uh, anxiety medication. Some newer approaches are uh, psychedelics and ketamine, which seem to be promising, but they're not uh, always easily available these days. Uh, uh, for people who have treatment resistant depression, ketamine is an approach that is uh, helping a lot of people. 
All right, just wanted to kind of add some of that stuff in since it wasn't covered and I think it's important. Preventing teen suicides. Suicide is the third most frequent cause of death after accidents and homicide among US accidents. 10% have reported attempting suicide. That's crazy. One in 10 people. Girls are almost twice as likely to attempt suicide. Native Americans are more likely to attempt suicide than other racial groups. Um, the strongest predictor of suicide is depression. Signs of suicide include planning to hurt the self, talking about death, feeling hopeless or helpless, and feeling like a burden to others. Do not ignore the signs. If you see them, get help. Do not ignore the signs uh, in other people and your friends. Um, encourage them to get help. Do what you can to uh, listen to them, ask questions, um, encourage them to get professional help. Adolescent limited antisocial behavior consists of relatively minor criminal acts by those who aren't consistently antisocial, short-lived, usually vanishing by late adolescence. Life course persistent antisocial behavior is antisocial behavior that emerges at an early age and continues throughout life, hitting at three, shoplifting at 12, car theft at 16. Fewer than 5% of the youth fit this pattern, but 5% is still a lot, five out of every 100 people. Contributors to life course antisocial behavior include heredity, identical twins are more similar than fraternal ones and physical aggressiveness, biology, being temperamentally difficult, cognitive processes, family processes, and the last one is the big one that affects everything and everything and anything and everything and anything and everything, which is poverty or socioeconomic status, as it's sometimes called. Early prevention programs such as Fast Track can be effective at reducing later criminal activity. So these programs are essentially trying to combat some of the imbalances of poverty. Okay, chapter summary. Now that the lesson is ended, you should have learned how to summarize identity and development and self-esteem during adolescence, summarize romantic relationships during adolescence, sexual behavior and sexual minority youth, describe how teenagers pay career and how they're influenced by part-time work, Describe the causes and consequences of substance use and depression and delinquency in adolescence. I think we did all that. Okay. Uh, I will talk to you all soon.